Greetings, I'm Barrent, and welcome to Meet Me at the Table. Today we are going to be diving into the Deep Woods. That's right, we are starting our playthrough of Oathsworn. We're going to be moving through the story of the first mission, and then we'll be doing our first encounter in the encounter book. This is an expansive, story-driven boss battler. I'm super excited to dig into this game. This is one of the games I've been waiting for forever, and I'm super excited to finally bring this to the channel. We'll be playing with four characters and none of them are gonna be companions. In this game, you could actually use some of the PCs as companions so you could make it a faster and easier way to run the game, but we're gonna give it a shot and actually play with four characters at once. The first character we're going to be having in our free company is the priest. This is the most voted for by my Patreons. And of course, like I said, if you're interested in supporting the channel, please check out the link in the description below. We're going to set our priest up. The first thing you're going to do is take your bag of all the cards and everything that is for this character it has. We're then going to take all of the cards that actually have this symbol on it. These are your starting ability cards. So we're going to take all of these ability cards and we'll just place them right here for our priest. On top of that, every free company member starts with three iron. There are these tokens right here. They are normally cardboard. These are part of the Kickstarter, being able to get to these cool, super neat iron coins, which pretty much makes them really iron. <laughs> then we're going to take one of our dice. We're going to set it to six. That is going to be our hit points. We'll place it right there. On top of that, we are going to be getting our starting animus, which are potentially, are basically action points in this game, and we'll place them right here. Down there, we get a total of six according to this, and we can regen six. The max we can have have is eight. Then we're going to take our cards. Every character starts with certain items. The two items that our priest starts with are these two cards here, a pig iron coat, which is going to give three defense when we go into the actual encounter. And we also have this great maul. This great maul is its weapon. If you notice down here, there's a cube. This is a cube that we're going to set in the might track. As you continue through the game, you may gain more powerful weapons that are going to give you different might colors in here, which are going to be able to influence the dice or cards, whichever you decide, to be able to gain better attacks against some of the monsters coming through the game. Also, on top of that, every weapon usually has an ability. This one says when you critically, during an attack that hits, add two damage and two knockback to the attack. I can use that after the hit has been made. Once it's done, I would have to put it in cooldown too. There is a neat battle flow system that you'll be seeing as we play through the game. And it would just go into this position here. And there's a symbol here on this card. If you look right here, it has an X through it. This will not cause battle flow, which means it would not push any of the other cards around. If you notice here, this one says three, but it is circle through the battle flow to item or icon right there is there. So it would start here. And if you ever played a number another three card, you'd be able to battle flow it to there. But this would not help with that. Then on top of that, we have to get our cool miniature. Here's our priest. He's all painted up and ready to go. I've made sure to get them all painted the best I could for this adventure. These models are really super cool, and they're a lot bigger than other models I've played with in other games. And they're all pushed to fit, so as we go through this game, we'll be able to swap out all the different arms and things for our characters to kind of give them the illusion of what you see is what you get. We'll place that there for the time being until we're told to use our miniature, and that is how you set up your character. Before we move on to the other characters, I do want to mention that every one does have a special ability. This one says if you have three health or less, gain one health at the start of each refresh phase. That's a really good power. The next member of our free company is going to be our Penitent. I've grabbed his cards. He has six Animus, six health, three iron. He has three things up here. We've seen the pig iron coat. He has a buckler, which is going to give him an additional defense. And then he's got this cudgel right here. It says when you critical during an attack that hits, add one damage and one knockback to the attack. So if we really need to do that damage, this would be a good card to play once we hit. We do have his miniature right here. He's all painted up. He's got these like different pieces of paper, probably part of his penance that he's draped all over himself. It's a really super cool model. I'm, I think this one is one of my favorites. It's really neat. His special power here states, for each health you lose, I get to gain an empower token, which is going to help increase our ability to hit in battle. 
Our next character is going to be the Blade. That's this character right here. He again starts with a pig iron coat and he's got a long sword. This one states that after damage is drawn against you, I can gain one defense against that damage, which will help because normally you have to deal with what you want to use for defense before the cards are drawn. So this one's going to be able to help us after cards are drawn. He has his Animus, his Iron. He gets a token here, just like our Priest, because it is shown here on his card for his Might Track, and he has six health, and he has all of his cards, and here is the Blade. Remember when I said I was really excited about the Penitent? This one, I now I think about it, this is probably one of my favorite miniatures right here. This is amazing character. Check out all the detail on that golden armor that he wears, and he's got these cool-looking, uh, what do you call them, like, I think they're, like, masks or something that he has. He's not having any on. On, but maybe he'll be using those sometime during the story, which is pretty neat. So that's the blade right there. We'll move on to our last character. Our final character is going to be the our ranger here. The ranger has, a, well, first off, the miniature is pretty awesome. I love the fact that one of the cool things about this character is if you read a little bit about the backstory, she grows arrows out of her in order to fire, which is absolutely super cool. Now notice this person has seven Animus. So I have given seven Animus. Max of seven, though. I can't ever get more. All the other characters have a max of eight. So as we play through it, we might be able to gain some more Animus. Three Iron. We do get one Might because it's shown here on this bow. We have six health. And if we look at the bow, the bow states, when you attack, spend any amount of Animus to add two range to the attack for each Animus spent. The companion adds four range to attack. So if this was used as a companion, that's what that would do. So we'll place this one. And of course, if we use it, we'll have to put it in cooldown section one. Now, just because we use it doesn't mean we don't get to use the bows for range anymore but we are going to be able to we, we just don't get any we can't use that power again until we're able to cycle it back into our hand and that goes for all the weapons on our characters from this free company bag we're going to take out this card this is our backpack card it says you may store up to 20 item cards here not including items you carry on the back side it does say you can only carry 12 so until we upgrade our backpack we're only able to carry 12 we also have our rule reference cards you're going to pass these out to at least two of these to each character that is playing. I'm only going to need one because I'm playing by myself. Then we're also going to gain all of our allies that we start with with a star on the back. There's four that you're going to start with. Then there's four promos. We've got a few cool ones here. We've got Jonathan, the King of Average, and we've got Will from Roll for Crit. Now it's really neat. They have their own cards. Maybe someday I can be as cool as these guys and get my own cards in a game. Oh, come on. Jamie and Kobe, are you listening? Please put me in the game. That'd be awesome. We'll be able to use these allies as we play through the game. If any of our characters go down in battle, instead of just being out for the game, you're able to take one of these into battle then for, to replace your free company member that has died. It's a neat system that allows all the people at the table to continue playing even if your character is knocked out because into the deep woods, those deep woods are pretty dangerous. It's time now to dive into the story of Oathsworn, but we're not going to use the storybook's images here. We're going to use the apps. You can see what that is all about. Looking at the instructions here, it says open mystery envelope A and place its contents in the center of play. Place the free company marker on location 21 and place the chapter 1 time track beneath the map. Take the path A card. It's time to get real. Opening a mystery envelope. Here we are. This is, I guess you could stay where spoilers are going to start. If you don't want to see anything else, <laughs> I can totally understand until you get the game. But I'm just going to show you how this first mission is going to play out for you. We have our map here. It looks like this is the map of, let's check it out. It is the map of Bastone. That's amazing. We're going to, according to what our rules are, we're going to take that. We're going to take our story moment card here where we're going to be putting tokens down on a time track. It's upside down. Chapter one. There we go. The way this is going to work is we're going to be filling up these slots. As we fill these slots up, it's going to cover certain elements of this game. If ever any of the elements like this one where it has a story moment or a end of encounter moment are covered up, we're not going to be able to gain the rewards for that. When, the, when we end those two particular parts of the story. If we ever cover this one up, we're going to have to draw a city event card and we'll see what maybe some of those are as we play through the game. At this point, we are just going to place this right underneath just like that and we're going to put our character onto number 22. There isn't an actual party marker. You're just supposed to take one of the characters and place it down in one of the areas. I'm going to choose... Oh, that guy's base is a little bit out of control. Let's grab him. The penitent will be our marker for the story events. We have it here on 22 we have our thing here let's continue with the story before we get to the story there is one more thing i have to put our path a card out as well on the back side is path b this may be going back and forth while you're going through the story and it's going to influence how the story develops green mud sucks at your boots every stride a challenge as you trudge through the rain 
Your hands grip the thick iron cable of the wire road, pulled taut through rings, sunken into the trunks of hideous trees. For days now, it has been the only evidence of humanity's existence in the deep wood. Clinging to this lifeline has not worked for everyone, though. You are one less than when you left Verum. It was nothing any of you saw, just a thrum in the wire behind you, and then a scream disappearing into the dark. The memory is fresh in your mind, but this is not the time to mourn, not here. As you travel, vines and black tree trunks, spattered with sickly pink cysts, block your view ahead. Things slither away and rustle through the undergrowth, but they are of little concern. One cannot afford to jump at every noise in this place, or else you'd go mad. It is only when the sounds slither towards you that you need to worry. Relief from walking through this overgrown hell is promised as the huddled profile of the fortress town of Bastone looms in the distance. They are the ones that sent for you. People have been dying here, though not of hunger or of the deep wood. Those don't leave much of a man when they're done. Something else is happening here, something that is leaving plenty of bodies. The crumbling city walls tower before you. As you approach them, you spot something laying at their base. At this point, we have to make a choice to either explore the base of the wall or get out of the rain and head for Bastan's gate. I think we're going to explore the base of the wall. A driving rain battles the city walls as its ancient grey stones stand in defiance of the deep wood's reaching limbs and the beasts that stalk beneath them. The deafening roar of the downpour hinders your ability to detect the sound of any approaching threats. You stay alert, noting the danger. At the base of the walls you find jumbled piles of branches and bone collected together like nests. In one of the scattered nests lies a jawbone, most probably human. Woven into the twigs and branches of another nest is a cracked and broken mask, feminine in design. The one's full face mask of delicate ceramic now lies shattered. What would a Thracian noblewoman's mask be doing here? The question is left unanswered as a glint catches your eye. At this point, we're going to rate the keyword Kingkiller on your free company sheet, gain one random chapter one common item, and add a time token to the time track. If we look at our pad of free company, this is going to be all the info we need for our free company. Not our individual characters, but our free company. It says right here, record keywords and notes on the reverse side. So we've taken a piece of it off and I have wrote, wrote King Killer on the back of the free company pad. On top of that, it does tell us to take a time token and place it down on the first slot there. So I'll take one of our time tokens that looks like this. On the back side, it's exactly the same. This is just denoting that we have taken up time on our time track. Remember, if some of these get covers, we're not going to gain any of the bonuses going forward. So it rewards you for getting to the encounter faster, but of course, you also are not exploring as much of the city, and you might not be gaining items or tokens that could help you in the encounter. So it's kind of a, it's a really cool system. So like, how much do you go but versus how much do you try to get there as fast as you can? It's really neat. The other thing we're able to do is grab a card from the common item deck, and this is the common item deck we have available to us right now, which is common item deck one. We're going to give it a quick little truffle shuffle here. The items in this deck aren't going to be the greatest, mainly because they're the same type of items we have out here. All of our characters have these level one cards right now, and it's not random as to what my characters received at the beginning of the game. They're told to you in the instruction booklet how each person is supposed to be set up. Though if we once we get some of these cards, you're going to notice the list of different character symbols down here. Those are the type of characters that can use this. For example, we've got ourselves a bone knife, which these characters here could use. And one of them is the blade. So if I wanted to, I could replace his long sword with this one that says, when you're critical during an attack that hits, battle flow one card, companions can move two. So battle flow for other, uh, the companions is a little bit different. We're probably not going to go over that because I am playing all the characters. If you're interested in seeing how companions work, there are probably other videos that are able to do that. Though I don't think I want to give this to him because I will lose my might card here that I get from my sword. So we're just going to stick this into our backpack and we're going to hold on to this. We can sell these if we wish to for half their cost rounded up. So I could sell this for one as we continue on through our adventure. Why would anyone leave something so valuable this side of the wall? We'll now place location token 22 and go there. We'll take our 22 token here and place it down. And of course, I am a fool and put my character in the wrong spot. 
22 is right here. We'll place that token down and then it says we're supposed to go there. This token then will have two different uh, numbers on the back side of it. The first one is going to be path A and the second one will be path B. So since we have our path A to or card out there, we'll be reading 22.1. If we had 20, a path B card out, we'd read 22.2. The app though will keep track of all of your choices. So you don't have to worry about the path cards if you're using the app. We'll take our token and place it right down here to show that we've done another time. So we only have one, two, three, four before we'll be covering up one of these markers here that's going to give us an advantage in the combat. Let's go to 22. As you approach the thick wooden gate, a small slat slides unevenly open and a weary, coal-caked face peers out. Moments pass as he eyes you with suspicion, taking inventory of your many weapons. Then one of you reveals the mark on your wrist. He grimaces. Hmm, free company, uh, let me get this open. The slat slams shut, and you hear chains strain as a mechanism pulls the gate open, swinging out just wide enough to squeeze through. You move into the gateway passage and find it blocked ahead by an iron portcullis, a second layer of defence creating a quarantine area. In the passage with you is a single table, lit by a foul-smelling lantern on the wall. You hand him your papers. I'm sure you know the drill, the guard urges, as he thumbs through them. Arms extended out from your sides, he raps against you repeatedly with a short hollow tube of wood. He nods, then sniffs, satisfied you have brought nothing of the deep wood in with you. You've not come too soon. More bodies last night, he says, as he moves to a rickety table in the corner to mark more paperwork. Papers say you're five. A grim silence from you answers his next question. Right then. An oath fulfilled, I suppose. He looks uncomfortably away and motions towards a logbook with ink and quill beside it. Make your mark. According to our instructions here, we're going to have to create a name for our free company. Define a key attribute for your free company by choosing which one of the following statements most accurately describes your company. Let's take a look at these. The first one says, you are faithful to the oath and your God. You must trust that your arm is given strength by more than mere muscles. The second one says, you are at least one standing, the ones who seal the breach and protect the innocents. Shoulder to shoulder, you will hold the line, whatever it comes at you. The third one is that the deep wood is fierce, but you're worse. You never met a problem that can't be solved with a sharp edge. Number four is death is a dance that you know well. You flow through fights in perfect form. Training gets you only so far. The rest is raw talent. And the final one is discipline or death. Keep marching, keep moving, keep fighting until the job is done. Press in and press on. So of all of these, I think the one that we're going to choose is you are the last one standing. I mean, why not? If we're not standing, then the whole world is going to fall. So let's take a look at that. Okay, it looks like we have more instructions here. It says, all Oathsworns gain a permanent defense token. Note this on your character card. Let's take a look at that. So again, we'll take out our free company sheet here and we'll have to put a name up here. I don't have a good name, so if anybody has some names, please leave them in the description of the video and Colin and I will figure out which one we think would be the best to describe our free company. These are our starting character cards here. We get to give ourselves plus one defense tokens. So whenever we go into encounters now, we'll have that. That's going to be really good. And as you can see, you can only have a max of three of any of these. I need to put my hit points up here. We also have our starting animus regen and max animus. I haven't really wrote those in yet because we haven't had any changes to what our character cards would be. We, it looks like we need to name all our guys too. So if anybody's got some great names for any of these free company members, please let me know in the comments below because we got lots of things we have to name. Oh my gosh, all these free company members need names so yeah let me know what you think the guard seals the paper with wax and nods to those outside the portcullis with a slow grind the iron gate raises to let you through you understand your task find whoever or whatever is responsible for the unexplained deaths as you step out onto the main thoroughfare of bastone a sea of unwashed citizens churn through the mud going about their daily struggle welcome to my glorious bastone a voice chimes from your right you all turn to the voice. A street urchin, caked in dirt under an explosion of dark hair, leans nonchalantly against the outer wall. If I hadn't been so clever, I might try to lighten your pockets. Looks like you're too much for me, though, right? You come out of the green all bristling with blades fresh from the wire. No, me ma made no fool, 
and that's why I'll let you pass without paying my toll. Now, I know what you're thinking. We need that kind of charitable citizen to show us around. Well, usually I'd say no, what with all my responsibilities around town. But for you, I make an exception. For today, and I make this place feel like home for you. Get you anything or anyone you need. Take you anywhere you want and keep you from running into the less reputable around here. So at this point, we have to either negotiate with the boy or ignore the boy and attempt to navigate the stone. I'm going to guess if we don't negotiate him, he's probably going to take our money and run anyway. So let's negotiate with him. Encouraged by the fact that you haven't left, the boy redoubles his efforts. Midge is a name, and there's none finer to see around these parts. It's clear you've no more need of muscle, but I've another skill. I can read. That's right. I stand before you as a scout, guide, scholar, and sage. Midge pushes his way between you to block your way to the town centre. Also, there may be four of you, but I think you need another pair of eyes. He grins and shows a spread of four iron coins in his hand. You really should take more care of these. He holds out the money to you. See, I told you you'd not pay my toll. So, do we have a deal then? At this point, we either have to reject his offer and attempt to navigate the stone alone, or accept his offer and try to haggle with the boy. I don't see why we wouldn't haggle with him, because again, he'd probably try to take our money anyway. Instructions here, let's take a look. It says, perform a bartering check with difficulty 4. If you succeed, lose 2 iron. If you fail, lose 4 iron. But I do get to gain ally card 1, Midge. We've come to our first skill check. At this point, we have two different ways we could do this, or actually, I guess, multiple ways. You could either A, draw cards to decide if you're gonna be able to pass the skill check, or B, we could roll dice, or we could do a combination of that. The way we decide how many and what colors we use are based on our characters. We have to be making a bartering check with a difficulty of four. We don't have anything that's going to give us bonus to our bartering check. So at this point, we're just going to take as many white dice or white cards as we wish to, and we'll either roll or flip them. Once we do that, we're going to see if we are able to pass our check. We have to get four or more on as many dice as we want to choose, up to 10. But if we ever have two blanks, we are going to have failed that skill check. So we'll take our dice or our cards and we'll roll them up. I'm going to choose four dice just to see just to see how this all goes. We'll see what happens here. We got only one blank. We got two twos and a one. That's a total of five. This right here means that you have had a crit success. So you get to draw, roll another dice and this dice is exploding. Okay, I got another blank. Oh, that's two blanks. That means we would miss, but no, it doesn't. If you ever get a miss for your criticals, that does not count to the towards the two misses that are going to happen if whether or not you would pass a skill check. So we have four, five. So we did pass a skill check. So we only have to pay two iron. I'm going to grab the priest's iron and I'm going to grab the penitent's iron. And we're just going to discard those two iron. Everybody has three except for those two characters. They now only have two iron. On top of losing two iron, though, we do get to have Mitch as now one of our allies. He's going to be added to our free company bag, and he may stay with us, or he may be removed at some time during the game. Unless it's stated otherwise, characters usually start with six hit points. This one is a non-combat ally, so if anybody falls in battle, we couldn't bring out Midge as part of our group to be able to try to keep taking on the encounter that we're in the process of. This may help us in some of the story events going forward, though. Now that that's done, let's continue and see what happens. In tavern or pub, Midge grins. You're not sure what the difference is between the last two, but correct his expectations and explain that you need to know more about the bodies. He shrugs. Been nasty. They've been finding bodies and bits of bodies all over the slums for weeks now. Nobody does nothing until a noble was found dead and scattered about an alley. Realisation widens in his eyes. Are you them, then? The house sworn? You nod and Midge grimaces. Bugger, we didn't agree no hazard pay. Ignoring the boy's comment, you begin to question him about the town. He tells you of various locations, and you begin to form a plan for the hunt. Bastone has many of the usual landmarks, and there is a banksmith and apothecary to trade with, for the supplies you may need for what is to come. Again, there are some instructions. Let's take a look. Oh, we have to place a bunch of tokens out. 2, 3, 7, 12, 13, 14, 16, and 19. Let's go ahead and place those. And then after that, we're going to have to choose a location. We'll have to think of which location that we've just placed out there we want to go to and click on the one that we decide to do. I've placed down all the tokens and zoomed in a little bit on the map so you can see all the different places. We have the market we could visit, the Broken Oak, the Banksmith, 
the town square 16, which doesn't actually have a name. We also could go to the apothecary or the archives. There are two places that whenever you're in the town, you can always visit at any time from what I understand. And that's the banksmith and the apothecary. The apothecary allows you to buy curatives that are going to help prevent you from taking or potentially taking injuries if any of your Osworn go down during the in counterpart of the game. The Banksmith is where we could go to spend or spend money to buy items or we could sell some of the cards we have. It's up to us if we want to do that. Now of course we only have the one card. It's only worth one. I don't think it's worth going there because of course that will take up some time. When the tokens are down though, these might have story events that may help us as well. But from where we are, I think we're going to take a look at, let's go to the Broken Oak. That sounds like an inn or tavern that might be able to help us out. I'll place this 13 into our time track. That's now our third token into the time track. I'll place ourselves here and we'll go to number 13. Now if you're reading out of the storybook you would take your token and flip it over and since we're on our path A card we would look at 13.1 but if we're on B we go to 13.2. The app of course like I said will track all of that for you and so let's take a look. A well-tended inn shows promise. Entering you find an amber fire glowing in the hearth. It is warm, dry and seemingly inviting. Pause peace. A burly man says, smiling. His eyes are slightly distant, revealing that his attitude may come more from a bottle than his heart. The yams are fresh and the rum's dark as a deep wood. A newcomer steps up beside him. Something's not fresh because it's green, Bram. Especially if it's supposed to be yellow. He turns to you. He tries at least, and he's not lying about the rum. Grey cane. The man introduces himself with a nod of deference. I am the eyes and ears of this town. The mouth more like, Bram offers from behind the bar. I'm also the bankroll of this establishment, he retorts with a knowing look to Bram. After a few pleasantries, Grey Cane leads a conversation around to the question of what he can do for a free company in Bastone. Hearing of your hunt, a light appears in his eyes. The son of Lord Arden's been the talk of the town. Word is... He's been frequenting a certain sort of alley, being less than noble. That's where they found his seal, the noble crest, bathed in blood. No body. The crust blamed the common folk, but I think it's something else. And I'm glad Davenish had the forethought to call you in. Again, we have more instructions. Let's take a look. It says that you gain clue token one. If you have a clue token two, I get to place location four. We don't have that right now. Having only one clue token, we don't have two, and according to their rules, it did say we needed two to get another thing put down. So let's continue exploring our city. Let's go up to the archives. Maybe the archives will know something of what's going on. That's going to be number two. We'll place that down on our time track as well. You find the town archives and an irksome clerk named Milus. The deaths, I presume, the clerk says dismissively. I suppose you should follow me, then. Everything is collected. You'll not find our numbers wanting. Move nothing. The records Milus helps you sort through deal with a large list of missing persons, a pile dedicated to what appears to be suicides, and a tally of the local dead, with the cause of death inked beside each name. The details are grisly, and some descriptions have no name attached, where only bits of bodies and blood trails were all that remained, yet left no doubt that there was a killing. I don't know why you bother with the peasantry and their ilk. Their numbers wax and wane like the sun, he says dismissively. What should be of concern is my timber figures. Nine cords of wood marked used last month for various reasons, mostly funerals. But records show only seven cords being pulled in, two cords unaccounted for. What is the world coming to? Either the gatekeepers are not doing the job or someone's lying, and there's nothing worse than lying on a census. That's the real crime here. The archives were super helpful. Not. <laughs> He didn't help us at all. So we have to find another place to go. We do have to choose a new location. So at this point, let's try the town square. We'll be going to the middle of the town. Somebody there might be able to help us out. Smells of cooking pots and the sound of fervent bartering roll over you. Glancing around, you meet the eyes of the destitute peering from dark alleys and crooked doorways. The square itself seethes with people who retreat to give your party a wide berth when they notice you, creating an island in the rolling sea of bodies. You come to another area, bereft of people. At the heart of the square is a ten-foot-tall iron post driven permanently into the flagstones. Heavy links hang from welded bolts, and a large ring of black soot scores the area at its base. Others you have seen of this kind are made from wood. How many people are they burning to warrant one made of iron? 
you canvass the area and discover that this functions as a crossroads between East and West Bastogne, and it seems no violent deaths have been discovered in West Bastogne. Again, we have more instructions. Let's check them out. We have gained clue token two. If you have clue token one, which we do, we're going to be able to place location token number four. We gained our second clue token. I'll place that down there. And now we can place number four out on the board. With that new token on the map, I don't see why we don't go there. <laughs> we're going to go to number four, put that down in our time track here, and see what happens. Using the information you have gathered and, with the help of a couple of street urchins from the east side, you find the spot the noble was killed. You walk the shady alley. Even the drunken dying avoid the end of this street. Bloodstains still spatter the walls, the rain running down them having little effect on the marks. You search the area for something to help you in your task. Again, we have some more ins instructions. It says to perform a spot check of difficulty four. This time, we're going to be clicking on whether we succeed or we fail. For our spot check, again, we don't have any extra dice for, or any better dice to roll. So we just grab as many white as we want. I'm just going to use four, and I'm going to be using dice for us, but I'm going to be using the cards for the enemy when we use our encounters because that's what the rule book tells you to do is you have to use cards for the enemies just to keep it more balanced. But when it comes to Old Sworn, we could choose both. I'm going to use dice for them, though, because it's super fun and super dynamic. And look at that. I got another crit, so let's roll that up again. So I got nothing more for my crits. I'm a super good roller for crits. <laughs> but I got two, four, six, seven, so that is a success. Your eyes follow trickling water down the walls, watching as it gathers in the gutters, then runs towards a nearby sewer covered with a hatch. Curious, you haven't noticed other large hatches. A coincidence? Examining the hatch, you find it's not fixed and sits off kilter. Your nose protests, but your guts tell you this is it. Again, more instructions. Let's take a look. All old swarms get to gain a redraw token. That'll be good. We'll place our redraw token right on here. This allows us to either redraw a card or re-roll a die. And whenever it says redraw, you could also use it as a re-roll. We're going to give the other three to the other members of our free company. You squeeze through the hatch into a dark maze of rough-hewn passages, your torches glowing pale blue in the noxious air. Ankle deep in waste and muck, you slog through winding tunnels, kicking aside rats and brushing away cobwebs, looking for any clue as to what might be behind this. Around one corner you stop. There is a splashing. A thick, heavy motion lumbers towards you from a shadowy side passage. Sounds of chittering and nervous clicking conjure memories of past ambushes, prompting each of you to draw your weapons. Whatever it is, it is low and hunched. This is no rat. This is something much larger, and it's moving fast. There are more instructions here. Let's take a look. It says, Secret Decision. Set your die to one if you wish to attack, or two if you wish to not attack. When you're playing with multiple people, this is a really cool concept, but playing solo, it's not really going to make that much of a difference, so we'll just make our decision without using these dice. And I think the decision is we are going to prepare to defend ourselves. Besides, we're all about defending. As it scampers closer, you can make out a hunched mass of ragged hair. You ready your weapons at the approach. As it enters the flickering light from your torches, a man's face emerges, a rat catcher from the look of him. You! he shouts. Have you seen it? He notices your weapons drawn. You have? Good. Come, you must see this. He turns, but then cautiously looks back. Don't eat any of the rats. They're mine! He glares, showing broken teeth. At that, he scurries off the way he came at a surprising speed. It's not much, but it's the only thing you have. You follow. The little man is fast, and in this confined space, it's difficult to keep up. Again, we have more instructions. Let's take a look. Each Oath Sworn performs a survival check of difficulty 3. Each Oath Sworn that fails this check falls. Hurting themselves, they lose 1 hit point. And hit points are really valuable in this game, so I don't think we want to lose any. I don't have anything helping with survival checks, so I'm just going to roll up three dice and see how it goes. We'll start with our priest. Each person has to make one of these tests. He is totally fine. He got way more than three. We'll go to the blade. The blade got four, and this one fell out. Doesn't even matter. And then we'll move on to the archer. The archer's going to roll up oh, only two. So the archer has failed the roll. I could choose to use the reroll token if I wish to, but I don't think I am. I'm just going to take the one damage for a fail, bringing my dice down to five if I can find it. There it is. The last person we have is the penitent. He's going to roll his dice as well. He got a total of three successes with an exploding die, so I could roll more if I want to, but we've already passed. So only the archer failed. You enter a small chamber. Bones are strewn across the floor, and heaps of rags dot the area. 
Oddly, a pile of books is carefully stacked against one wall. You wonder how this could smell worse than the passages you are just in. The rat catcher is scrabbling through one of the piles, then rises, wielding something over his head. You realise it's a dismembered arm. Look at the bites here. See? Rats. The hand is calloused. A farmer, my guess, from the underways. Mushrooms and roots. His nails long, chipped. Good digger. Two things I know are men and rats, but never nothing like this. He turns the arm over and puts his finger deep into a blackened wound. The tooth that bit this arm. He looks at you with a serious glare and holds his thumb and forefinger six inches away from each other. You ask him if he knows where the rat came from. He looks up at you, almost excited. He nods. Let Cedric join the great hunt, and I'll take you. I don't see why we don't let Cedric join us, so let's do that. We have more instructions. Let's take a look. We get to gain ally card 2, which is Cedric. Add Deepwood event card 8 to your Deepwood event deck, and city event card 18 to your city event deck. Another ally has joined our free company ranks. We now have Cedric. He is a rat catcher. This guy looks a little bit better than the normal free company members we have. And down here has a power that says move four or I can attack. And that's if he uses animus. He also has an ability here that says when you attack a creature with four or more legs, gain a redraw token on the, or gain a redraw, sorry, on that attack. So he's going to be pretty good against multi-leg creatures. If we ever lose one of our Osworn, he'll be the one we bring in. The place Cedric leads you to is a junction that runs along the outer wall of the city. You know this as you can see the tree line of the deep wood through a hole where a solitary foundation stone has somehow shifted out of place. Blood stains highlight the opening on all sides, concentrating on this point as if bodies or body parts have been forced through the gap. He's not alone, you know, the rat that bit that arm. You turn, listening to the rat catcher. He was a pup, certainly. They look different, mothers of dozens of pups he murmurs, fingering the scores of tracks leading to the hole. Dozens. We have more instructions. Let's check it out. Reveal the encounter special rules board. Mark the special rules box for the chapter one on your free company sheet. Being able to reveal the special encounter card for the special rules for our enemy is going to have some big advantages. We get to see exactly how this character is going to react. It looks like it's going to have some extra people attacking with it. There's some mob of minions here, and it shows us what dice and the defense of it. On top of that, as the game progresses, you're going to have more cards in your deck that you can use to decide how you want to come into battle with. You can only ever bring a limited number of cards to the battle, and being able to see this special rules card is going to help you decide what kind of tactics tactics you want when coming into it once you see what this creature normally does. For this first one, it's just kind of cool to see it. It's not really, I think, going to help us too much, mainly because we don't have any other cards we can bring into battle based on anything we see on this card. We start with just our starter cards. At this point, we now either have to set a trap for the brood and wait for it to return to the hole or follow the trail while it's fresh. I think we would, I'm going to try to set a trap. Maybe we can actually get a jump on this thing and do some damage to it. You coat the area in oil and cleave to the shadows, lying in wait for the trap to be sprung. Twilight is settling beyond the hole when the scratchings of clawed feet can be heard outside. Cedric breathes heavily in anticipation for what's to come. He seems to enjoy his work. More instructions? Oh, we, look at this. All Osworn get to gain another redraw token. Wow, we've got a lot of these. Another reroll token is going to be placed onto our characters. Kind of wish I would have maybe used one on the archer now that we've got multiples on all of our characters. So yeah, each of our old sworn, or I should say free company, sorry, all have two redraw tokens. A head the size of a wolf's juts into the gap, followed by a nightmare of festering fur and yellow teeth as it presses its bulk into the passage. Behind it, another head appears, then another, and another. One turns towards you and hisses. You strike your flint. Flames engulf the brood, squealing, writhing bodies roll on the ground. You dispatch the remaining ones quickly, disgust strengthening your blows. Now for whatever's out there. You squeeze through the small hole and find yourselves in the no-man's land between the city walls and the deep wood. You look off to the tree line and check your compass. This item is near sacred to you as well as all free companies. It is the only chance you have of navigating your way back after you enter the deep wood. You steal yourself and head in. Again, more instructions. Let's check them out. Add a time token to the time track. Do not trigger any effects on the time track. And again, we all get to gain a redraw token. Wow. 
I'll place a time track right here. Now that's going to cover up our gain this token for the story after the story moments here, but sadly that's just how it's going to be. If I cover another one, I'd have to enter into a city event. Though remember our app did say to ignore anything on there. So we wouldn't actually do the city event since we're so deep into the story. I am going to give each of our characters yet again another redraw token. That is super cool. She won't be far, Cedric says, looking around nervously. He had asked to come and you start to wonder why, but then remember, you could ask yourself the same question. Cedric easily leads you along a trail of sickly brush, torn and trampled by many feet. Half a league from the city walls, you come across a large, circular depression littered with scraps and bones. That is when you see her, the hulking rat-like form of the broodmother. She is twice the height of a man. Her back undulates with rats that swarm around her, as she lifts a huge snout, testing the air. Her great head of rotten fur and gnawing teeth rolls towards you, and with a ravenous hunger, her eyes meet yours. We have again more instructions. If you have the mystery chest, open mystery box one. If you do not have the mystery chest, open mystery envelope. That's whether or not you have the miniatures version or the standee version. We are now going to proceed to the chapter one encounter in the encounter book. Let's take a look. Hit the encounter button. Oh, look at that. There it is. The brood mother. There's some more instructions. Let's take a look and see what it says here. After the encounter, continue the epilogue. Okay, so let's do all of this. This is going to be absolutely fantastic. So at this point, we're going to be moving into in the encounter. I want to make two separate videos for this in case some people do not want the story spoiled and they want to experience that, but don't mind seeing how the boss battle takes effect. So we're going to be packing up all of our story elements. All these are going to be discarded. We're going to lose our clue tokens. We're not going to need those. Our path card will go back in the box and we'll be putting in our story events back to the box as well. Again, I've kind of been sleeving as we go, and so things have been fitting into the box as long as I kind of sleeve as I go, but I'm kind of worried as we continue that we might not have everything sleeved and still be able to fit everything in the box. That's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for watching the story part of Old Sworn and how you set up your characters. If you did enjoy the video, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell so you know when the next video comes out. It's going to be coming pretty much back to back on this channel because I want both of these to be able to be seen as fast as possible. On top of that, I'll be joined by Colin from the One Stop Co-op Shop to be continuing our coverage of Old Sworn going forward past Mission 1. Please feel free to check out the link in the description below if you're interested in joining my Patreon to help decide what happens in, in Old Sworn, and not only in Old Sworn, all the other games we play as well. The comments section is also where you're going to find any potential errors I have made in the video. If there isn't already a subtitle here, after the release of the video, I put a pinned comment for any errors that may have occurred during the playthrough of this game. So please check those out if, to make sure that you fully understand how this game is played. So there you have it. That's the story moments for Old Sworn Into the Deepwood, our mission one. I'm excited to go into the encounter. And if you're excited to see if our characters can make it through, then I need you to meet me at the table.